Hello, Catherine, and hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me this evening. It's really exciting to be able to, uh, to host this Cool Climate South African tasting. I'm hoping you can all hear me, fingers crossed. Um, good, got some thumbs up there. Um, so I absolutely adore South Africa. I was lucky enough to visit uh, once uh, a couple of years ago and fell in love with it. Um, but I'm particularly a fan of cool climate wines as well, which is quite ironic. My parents live in the Southern Rhone, so I spend my life drinking big, busty, heavy red wines, uh, but my heartland is with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in particular. So Cool Climate South Africa really is a marriage of two of my absolute favourite things in the wine world. So delighted to have so many of you to share it with this evening. Uh, I'm going to start with a presentation. So I hope you don't mind. This should all work. Apologies for the delay. Lovely. So hopefully you can all see that well. Uh, so Cool Climate South Africa. We've got a beautiful shot of the Cape there, surrounded by sea. And I'm going to talk a bit more about why that's important shortly. Um, wine growing areas of South Africa. So most of South Africa is, uh, well, a large part of South Africa is not suitable for wine growing. So most of it is focused down in the Western Cape. Um, and the Northern Cape doesn't, doesn't really get a huge amount. Western Cape is the third largest province, both in terms of size, uh, but also in terms of population. And one of the reasons of that, for that is it's Cape Town is that lovely red section you can see uh, the peninsula down there. So we're going to focus on the Western Cape. That's where the quality wine regions are. Uh, and I will just briefly uh, say which are the main regions of South Africa. South Africa is divided basically into um, large regional sections and then we narrow down into districts and then we go down into uh, wards. So uh, hopefully you can all see, just let me know, is the screen sharing going okay? Fabulous. So uh, these are briefly the regions. There are five major regions. Uh, the ones that we're going to focus on today are, surprise, surprise, in the coast. So the pink and the green regions on your map. If we narrow down even further, we start to talk about districts. Now we're gonna focus again on some coastal areas, surprise, surprise, being cooler climate, um, and I will, touch on where those are later on and you'll see this map again. But interestingly, South Africa's main um, equivalent to Appalachian, shall we say, a French version of Appalachian, are really these wards. And these wards are much smaller and they're more defined by what we would consider terroir. So the three areas I'm going to talk about today are two awards. One is actually a district, but it's the only geographically terroir driven, driven district. And um, because those previous maps I showed you, they're kind of all consuming. They're more defined by geography, whereas these are much more defined by climate and by soil. So you can really get down into the detail. So why is there cool climate why, why are there cool climate areas to grow wine in South Africa? Uh, one of the main reasons is uh, this current here that you can see. Now, South Africa is actually on the 35th parallel. Uh, in European terms, we're talking something like Cyprus. So it should really uh, be a very warm area and we should be talking about hot, sun-loving, uh, you know, really, really rich grape varieties. But actually the main difference here is this mass um, of water that you can see, the enormous stretch of water between the tip of the Cape um, and Antarctica. If you can see there on that map, point eight, point eight is where uh, the Southern Hemisphere sort of current comes through. So this is a better photo uh, or a better demonstration, I should say, of what's going on actually on the point of the Cape. B, you can see here, is the Benguela current. Now that is literally cold, cold waters 
being drawn up to the north from the Antarctic and it intercepts the southwest coast of, of South Africa. Conversely, coming down the other side, we have the Agulhas current. Now the Agulhas current is actually very warm. Um, so where those two currents meet, there are still some cool climate uh, areas, but all of that stretch down the red side is really, really quite warm. To give you a point of reference, uh, Hermanus, which some of you may have heard of, this coastal town, uh, is just on the cusp of where those two meet. And Hermanus, the beaches temperature average around 15 degrees. Coast, and you, the water temperature increases five degrees. Um, and you're actually looking at an average of between 14 to 26 degrees. It's basically the Indian Ocean. So on one side, you've got an ice bath for your grapes. And on the other side, you've got a warm bubble bath. So you can't really get much decent viticulture there at all, um, but you certainly can't get cool climate. I absolutely love this next image. Now, the reason I love that is uh, you can actually see the cold effect of that Benguela current and that lovely cold blue strip um, and then the sort of like green slightly slightly warmer but still very cool currents. So I think that thermal shot gives you a pretty great idea about how cold we're talking compared to the other side of the country. So it's not just the current that cools it down. We have this glorious wind called the Cape Doctor. Um, it's actually a southern wind uh, and it does blow especially in the summer months and it brings more cold water up the coast. Now it does blow in the winter as well um, and that can be quite challenging because it can bring an awful lot of rain um, which can be obviously really difficult. Um, not always though as you know there's often drought problems in, in South Africa um, but in the summer this is absolutely essential. This is the cool uh, air conditioner of these cool climates. Um, now, most of the cool climate regions, as I mentioned, are close to the sea. So you get this beautiful channel coming through of cold maritime air, and it kind of creates mesoclimates, microclimates. So some of the best sites are to be found in these channels um, that channel air through. Now, if any of you have visited South Africa and you say, well, yeah, but I've been to Stellenbosch and they still talk about the Cape Doctor. There is still a wind that travels as far as Stellenbosch and it is still the Cape Doctor in theory. Um, but Victoria Carey, who works at Stellenbosch University described it really well. She said the sea breeze cools on two levels. There's the humid air and then there's the air movement. Now the humid air, that lovely dewy um, cold current air doesn't travel as far as Stellenbosch. It only travels about 20 kilometers in from the coast towards Stellenbosch. So it goes to about the Batellery Hills. There is still a lovely breeze in Stellenbosch, but it's lost a lot of that cold, uh, sort of cold feeling from the sea. So it works as a, a lovely current of air rather than a cooling air. Now, the Winkler scale, which is one of my absolute favorite, uh, <laughs> favorite things in the wine world, the Winkler scale is uh, five points, so you have five different scales um, and it's based on the temperature of regions. So they work out these five different regions. Um, now, you'll, I'm not going to go over this in detail. Uh, we will send the presentation around afterwards. I know it's quite hard to read. Um, but just to give you an idea, really cool climate would be somewhere like the Rhine in uh, Germany or Willamette Valley in um, Oregon. So they really focus on grapes that like cool climates, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Riesling. Right down the flip end on number five, you've got uh, region fives can grow grapes like Muscat that need a lot of heat um, and perhaps don't necessarily need the vibrant acidities. Now, cool climate South Africa, we would say they're regions three, two and one. Mostly cool climate South Africa are two on the Winkler scale, so they're more akin to Bordeaux. However, in colder vintages, uh, many vineyards have been moved to region one. 
So if you imagine we're now talking Rhine Valley or Willamette Valley levels of, of cooling temperatures. So quite significant. But what does that actually mean for growing grapes? Well, I've mentioned the first point. So that's variety selection. And um, there's absolutely no point trying to grow Grenache in the Rhine Valley. It won't ripen enough. So uh, you'll get underripe grapes. You might even not be able to get enough alcohol to produce a grape that's legally allowed to make wine. So variety select varietal selection is hugely important. Um, you'll notice that when we go through the regions, a lot of the grape varieties are quite similar. Um, there's obviously some nuances to each region, but actually um, mainly there are a certain set of grape varieties that cooler climates can and should grow. It also means that you need to concentrate on viticulture. So how you grow your grapes is really important. Um, there's various things you might need to do. Um, and in particular here, uh, with the Cape Doctor, viticulture is really important. If you've got a vineyard that's hugely influenced by that wind, you're going to need to grow your grapes in an entirely different way and manage your vineyard differently. But in terms of the finished product, so what does it mean for the flavours of the wine and things? Um, they call it extended hang time. Uh, essentially what that means is it ripens, the grapes can ripen much later into autumn. So you can harvest grapes in Elgin, for example, the third region we're going to talk about. You can harvest grapes in Elgin four weeks later than you can harvest them in Stellenbosch, even if they're the same variety. The reason is because the temperatures don't go as high, you get this long, slower process of ripening. That also means that your sugars might not spike as much and that will convert to slightly lower alcohol levels. Um, and generally, the slower you ripen grapes, you also develop the natural acidity uh, far easier than you would in very, very hot climates. So in terms of styles of wine, cool climate wines tend to be fresher. Uh, some people sort of say purer, but I think that uh, does a disservice, shall we say, to some of the hotter varieties. Um, but you can certainly get a really beautiful, optimal ripeness. Um, and you don't have to... Uh, perhaps manipulate in the winery as much as you might do. You know, you've got your acids naturally there. Um, that's not to do a disservice to wines grown in hotter regions, but it's often harder to get balance when you've got very, very hot climates and maybe some more work might need to be done. I'm gonna really quickly go over this because I also appreciate uh, anyone on a small screen might not be able to see this um, quite so easily, but I've picked three um, top areas to focus on today. And those are, for anyone who can see, those have lower mean temperatures. And I've picked the mean for February, which is their sort of peak summer temperature. So the average temperature in Constantia is 20.6, and Himalanard is 20.3, and Elgin being the coolest climate is 19.7. Of course, there are parts of Stellenbosch that are cooler. They're grown at higher altitudes. There are parts of um, Durbanville where uh, they have a huge burst of uh, wind in the afternoon. So where, whilst it looks high here, they could be five, one specific site could be five degrees cooler. But in general, these three regions are cool climate regions or wards. So let's start with Constantia. So when I was visiting South Africa, Constantia was the first region I, I visited. Um, it is a hop, skip and a jump, literally from Cape Town. So if you don't have much time and you're doing a, a few days in Cape Town, then Constantia is one of the easiest uh, areas to visit. And I've popped a star on the map because it's actually part of the Cape Town uh, district. So it's a very small uh, appellation, you could call it, within the Cape Town district. And it's on this beautiful uh, peninsula. And I've shown you this particularly because at the bottom you can see False Bay. And False Bay is hugely important for the cooling effects of the Constantia region. So 20.6 degrees C at its peak, um, which I've mentioned, or average temperatures. It does get 1,000 millimetres of rainfall, so they don't need to irrigate here, which is fabulous. The vineyards climb up the east-facing slope of Constantiaberg, the mountain, and 
Constantia Berg is actually an extension of Table Mountain. So for that reason, you get Table Mountain sandstone and you get some granite soils as well. Um, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon and Merlot tend to be uh, the most grown grape varieties, but you can get all sorts of things here. Um, a lot of people do cool, cooler climate Cabernet. Um, there are obviously also the sweet wines um, of the Constantia region. But in particular, modern winemaking has really focused on Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. So beautiful shot here, you can really see the vines going, uh, starting to go up that Constantia Berg mountain. The other beautiful thing about the Constantia Berg mountain is uh, it actually acts as a sun shadow, as it were. So it's 900 meters, um, but the sun sets over it. So if you have vineyards in the right place, such as Klein Constantia, um, you actually lose about an hour and a half of uh, direct sunlight each afternoon because the sun has set behind your mountain. Now, a lot of the time you might think, well, that's not good, but they do still get daylight. They can still ripen the grapes, but they haven't got that intense direct heat from the sun. So those vineyards sort of east facing, uh, they get this lovely shade and it allows them to, to have those extra, extra hours outside the sun. Like we all need sometimes if we've been sunbathing and we need to go inside. Uh, I'm going to also show you a beautiful shot of Eagle's Nest. Um, Eagle's Nest, another wine we stock. Now, this has less of the sun shadow than the likes of Constantia, but it is the steepest, I believe, slope in South Africa. So these, uh, well, sorry, vineyard slope. These uh, terrace vineyards are chiseled into the decomposed granite and clay. And it's got that beautiful sandstone in as well from, from Table Mountain. So here you've still got cool climate and that's because they're at altitude. They're much higher than the others. So we've got two types. Uh, well, we've got the Benguela current, we've got the Cape Doctor, and then we've got the altitude and the sun shadow. So plenty of opportunity for cool climate here. I've put this picture in just to show you how close it is to Cape Town. Um, the quality is not brilliant, so I apologize, but hopefully you can just see there, the city, you literally look down into the city of Cape Town and it's quite amazing. Um, and for my own guilty pleasure, I've put my own in. Uh, this is me at the top of the Sauvignon Blanc block of Klein Constantia a few years ago. It is at this point about seven kilometers from False Bay. So in the afternoon, the breeze can actually cool the vines down up here about five degrees centigrade. Uh, so this is at 300 meters, obviously it's not quite as high as some of the others, but it gets that amazing wind rushing through. Um, I regret wearing such a short sleeve dress on my trip, put it like that. Uh, I was nippy, but it was absolutely worth it for those views. And it's so cold. Uh, or so cool, I should say, that they make a deliciously refreshing uh, sparkling wine as well, an MCC, which I have in my hand here, and I thoroughly enjoyed it at the top of that mountain. Uh, one of my favourite glasses of wine I think I've ever had with Matt Dave, the winemaker there. So that's Constantia, easily the easiest cool climate spot to visit if you're staying in Cape Town, and I would highly recommend it, uh, making some delicious wines, many of which we stock. So I'm now going to shimmy down the coast uh, and go to another absolute pleasure of a place to visit. Uh, this is Hemelanada, which is within the Walker Bay region. Again, I've popped a little white star uh, for you to be able to just check where it is. For anyone who is familiar, uh, the town of Hermanus, the whale watching site, uh, is positioned basically right underneath uh, right underneath the Hemelanada area. Uh, it's, I would argue, relatively new in terms of uh, modern day viticulture. Um, so the first vines were planted there in 1976 um, by Hamilton Russell, who we sell a lot of the wines of. Um, and they didn't make their first vintage until 81. And Anthony said, uh, we planted all the noble varieties but he did say that he didn't plant Chardonnay. Now, he has since smuggled, was the words used, some Chardonnay from Burgundy 
and uh, they now focus on Chardonnay and Pinot Noir varieties. So that tells you something about the climate here. I'm just going to jump past one slide to show you a bit of perspective about where, how close you actually are to the sea. So um, that's Hermanus down on the right hand side of your screen and then the valley comes up almost adjacent to it but not quite sort of running at a slight angle and I'll show you a better representation of the valley here because actually within the ward of Hemelinada this is where you start to get really site specific um, there are three uh, the yellow the orange and the red the yellow is Hemelinada standard uh, it's closest to the Atlantic so it gets those amazing breezes coming up you have the likes of Hamilton Russell there, Bouchard Finlayson. Uh, you then go up to the orange. This is the largest of the three. Um, and Newton Johnson is a very uh, popular wine society wine. Uh, so you'll find those guys there. And then right at the top in the Hemelinard Ridge, uh, that red section is furthest from the sea, but you do have the highest elevation. Um, and I am gonna taste a wine from there shortly. Um, but generally in Hemelinada, it's 20.3 uh, degrees. They do have slightly less rainfall than Constantia. Um, and again, it's those classic colder climate varieties. So Chardonnay, Pinot, Chenin, Sauvignon Blanc. They are making some lovely racy Pinotage there. So less of the Stellenbosch style, more Pinot Noir Pinotage, um, obviously with Pinotage actually being a crossing um, and of Pinot Noir. Um, and then finally some Syrah, and it is more of a cool climate Syrah. Um, most of the vineyards are north, northeast, northeast, northwest and north facing down those slopes of Bockerveld. Um, and it's quite a shaly soil um, and it's very heavy in clay. So incredible soil to look at. The clay content is about 25 to 55%, depending on where you are. Um, and to give you a point of reference, that's about the same clay content as the Cote d'Or in Burgundy. Uh, the difference here, and you have to be honest, is that they are shallower and stonier uh, than the soils of the Cote d'Or, um, but the clay content is incredibly similar. Now here is the Newton Johnson vineyard. So that was in that middle section I mentioned, uh, so the Hemelinard Valley. Um, and this is a rare shot because you don't often see how close the wineries actually are to the sea. You usually see images looking down the valley on the beautiful views. Um, but actually, it's from Hemelinard's site. It's only four kilometers to the sea as the crow flies. Um, but it is looking southeasterly. Good news is that that wind we were talking about is just pulling the cold air off the top of the sea and right up into the Hemelinard Valley. So it's my second uh, trip down memory lane shot here. Um, now this was a relatively clear day, but one of the joys of having the Cape Doctor is uh, when those currents do come up through the ocean, from the ocean, they get trapped under clouds. And actually you can get quite overcast days with this lovely cold air underneath. Um, Hemelinard's not necessarily a place if you want to go and bask in the sun. I think a lot of people go to Hermanus thinking it's a beautiful holiday resort, which it is, uh, but it's not a sunbaby uh, type place. It's far more um, agricultural and it does have that lovely cooler feeling to it. Um, conversely, if you went over the other side of the mountains that are in that shot and continued over to the Cape Town side, the other side of the mountain is full of bright sunshine. So they're in this little uh, microclimate, uh, which does the grapes wonders. And I promised I'd talk about the Hemelinard Ridge, which is up at the top, because I do have uh, Chris Ulheit's Hemelrand Vine Garden 2017. I'm going to uh, have a sip of, shall we say. Um, up in the ridge, the rainfall is higher, so it does create some disease pressure problems, but it's beautiful high elevation. And this is actually Chris's winery in the shot here. So I'm gonna briefly touch on the wine. Uh, Chris's uh, Hemelrand Vine Garden 2017. Uh, it is this blend, the 2017, is actually 26% Chenin, 26% Chardonnay, and 23% Roussin, with some Vidalio and a tiny bit of Muscat, I think 4%, uh, 
um, and a touch of Viognier. So it's a lovely cake, white cake blend, um, but you will notice that those Chenins and Chardonnays that thrive um, on those colder climates are very, very evident in this. He does change the uh, blend, so I believe this is the highest Chenin Chardonnay proportion he's made, uh, but he did also say that he believes that this is the best vintage, uh, and 2017 was a fantastic vintage in the cake. Um, in terms of acidity, it's very high acid. Uh, it's a very slow ripening site. The, it's a single vineyard at 360 meters, um, and it's got all of those things we talked about gravel, clay, sandstone, uh, all of those lovely, lovely soils that we hope for. Um, and it's minimalist winemaking. So really, really low intervention. He's made beautiful grapes from that site uh, that I believe was planted in 2010. Uh, so relatively new vineyard, um, but Joe is a big fan, our buyer for South Africa. And I think we've got three vintages on sale at the moment. So if you did want to uh, venture into Chris's wine, I would highly recommend it and perhaps maybe even buy uh, all three vintages. I did have a taste earlier, so I won't bore you too much with it, but it's unbelievably refreshing. It's almost got this kind of um, kumquat Japanese pear thing, loads of acidity, loads of lemon, um, it's just a really, really bright wine. Uh, they don't use oak barrels, but they do allow the wine to sit on the lees. Amazing wine for uh, barbecues, white meats, all those sorts of things. So let's move on, and then I'll get my next wine afterwards as well. <laughs> um, but we're going to move on to our last region, which is the uh, within the Cape South Coast again, but it's actually a district of Elgin. And I mentioned earlier that Elgin was slightly different to the other larger districts. And that's because, and I hope this might explain it slightly better. Elgin is actually surrounded on all sides by mountains. So it's 70 kilometers from Cape Town and you have to go over the hot, Hot and Tots Holland mountain range, um, but it's it's a rim. There's four ways into the bowl. What is like a saucer, um, and you have to drive over mountain passes to get there. Um, it was once famous for apple farming. Um, it's more recently become a famous wine area, but it's still very very. Um, prolific apple area. So there's a lot of competition between apples and grapes. And arguably, if you're only growing grapes, it's actually more profitable for you to grow apples. So there's a big bit of investment and work going on on trying to keep the grape growers in Elgin because the wines are just fantastic. So as I mentioned, it is the coldest uh, region within South Africa. The vineyards are about 400 meters above sea level. Some are slightly higher up to about 500, but it is that bowl I mentioned uh, that's the most important thing. Um, the rainfall's relatively high, 1,011 millimeters, but that's good because it means they don't have to irrigate. It's the classic grape varieties again. We've got Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay. Here we get some amazing Riesling as well. Pinot Noir, Merlot and Syrah. And again, similar soils. We've got the sandstone coming down from uh, the mountain ranges, the clay, the weathered shale. Um, I put a, uh, I'm hoping you can see this, I put an average temperature comparison chart from uh, Elgin into this. Now, the blue line is a winery called Iona, who we work with, and they are the coldest wine uh, producer or vineyard site um, in, South, in the whole of South Africa. So they have plotted their average temperature in blue. Bone is plotted in pink. Um, and then you have Sancerre plotted in green. Now you will notice that through the peak of the growing season, Iona has the same temperature as Sancerre. And only just tiny just is it slightly warmer uh, in the summers so it doesn't quite have the same diurnal range as sunset but it does have really consistent cool climates 
And I know I've mentioned bone there in Burgundy, but they do say that the summer, the summer climate in Iona and in Elgin is somewhere between Sancerre and Bordeaux. So that gives you a bit of a reference point. This is a cooler climate and the asset that it has more than anything else is that it gets half the amount of rain of many of those places, in particular Iona that doesn't get too much rain. So you can get a bit of vine stress. Um, so let's just go on to my final slide to try and show you, and there really is no way to show you this, but Iona's at the bottom of this circ circle almost of uh, the basin. Um, it's 20 kilometers away from the Atlantic Ocean. So the Benguela current rushes through down the, um, down the valleys and it gets trapped and it really does get trapped into a valley bowl. So you have permanent cloud cover and again, similar to Hermanus, but in a, bu in a much, much greater extent um, or to Hemelinada, sorry. You have this cold circulation of air being trapped under overcast cloud. And it just means those vines are constantly being uh, you know, fanned, shall we say, um, which is really, really perfect for the styles of wine that are being made here. So I will finish on one final wine before we move on to some questions. I'm conscious I've been talking far too long. Um, I've got the Catherine Marshall Pinot Noir grown on clay from Elgin. Had this in the fridge. Um, I'm hoping for not too long. Clay soils actually produce some really lovely textured tannins. So we're not talking about a tutti frutti light, uh, you know, really, really should be chilled Pinot. Um, but we are talking about some more savoury notes. Uh, it's, it's really trying to make a new world wine um, in, an, in an old world style. Um, so it's high iron content. Uh, it's, got the, it's got fruit, but still with that incredible structure. Uh, it's matured for 11 months. Um, and it's the, even the barrels are burgundy coopered. So the, the barrels are imported from burgundy and a combination of ages. So of new oak, first, second and fourth. So some to impart flavor and some to not. It's everything you hope for in a Pinot Noir. It's got that bramble, black currant. It really is one of those wines where you think, would I be able to have, have said that was South African? And I'm not sure that you can. Um, it's beautifully pale, probably can't see, my light's not great here. Really clear, so aromatic. Um, I think it probably also could do with a few minutes um, in the glass, but absolutely scrummy. And uh, for the warm weather in England and barbecue season, cannot think of a better wine. So that's it from me. Um, and that's it from our well, my rush through, and I apologize, of three of my favorite cool climate areas in uh, South Africa. I believe that we have had some questions in already as well. So I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, Catherine, are you there to question? Hi. I am indeed, yes. Uh, we have had some questions. Um, again, if anyone would like to put any more into the chat, please do. We'll can get to those as well. So the first one we've got is from um, Lisa Harlow and I think Lisa is here so I think we're just going to be unmuting her and hopefully she will be able to ask her question. Lovely Lisa when you're ready. Oh hi my internet connection is a bit dodgy so I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Yes yeah and I think we actually met last year at a wine taste, South African wine tasting in Sheffield. Oh great. Yeah, which seems a long, long time ago in the days when we could go to wine tastings. So, um, so yeah, I just had a question. I mean, I visit South Africa a lot, but why do you think they don't grow more Riesling in these cooler climates? Because there's just a handful of producers and then uh, and they're very good Rieslings that they make. But yeah, there's hardly any Riesling grown at all. Yeah, I think with Riesling, there's a few things. Um, it's 
it really is so on that Winkler scale it really is a wine that should sit in Winkler one so I think when you have the right exact site uh, you know it could just be one vineyard of the winery that it works in then it's fine um, but it's not necessarily a grape that loves the sun too much um, and it really really does need a cooler climate so thinking off the top of my head um, we often stock the Klein Constantia Riesling um, and that is one tiny plot on a huge, I mean, I think there was something like 26 plots of Sauvignon Blanc to one plot of Riesling type ratio. Um, so I think even when you're in a cool climate, you might not necessarily have the perfect vineyard to grow it. Um, I know that Joe Locke has also uh, saved some of the Rieslings back. Uh, to So we've got some coming out in the fine wine list or at least one South African Riesling. Um, but yeah, it's very challenging. And you, I think the, the one of the problems is that it is a very hard grape to grow, unbelievably fickle. And being two on the Winkler scale is just going to possibly push you over the edge. Um, but the other thing is, and this is a personal thing, I um, I don't think Riesling as a grape variety gets the recognition it deserves. And I don't know how commercially um, not viable, but how commercially popular South African Rieslings are when they could be growing Sauvignon Blanc, for example, or Chardonnay, or more likely Chenin, um, because Chenin has an identity. Um, and I just, I agree with you, they're absolutely delicious and I wish there were more of them. Um, but I suppose the advice is when you find them, buy them up. Because yeah, because I know you, you've had Spian Cops before, which I, that's my favourite. I think he makes, I mean, if, you, if you've ever met him, he's absolutely bonkers mad. Um, but, that will um, be released in the fine wine list. So we well, have it in good. stock. But it's going to be released in the fine wine list. And everybody buys it. It's absolutely fantastic reasoning. It's really, really good. Fabulous. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. No problem at all. Right, Catherine. Yes, yes so the next question um, we had was from Carol Hazelhurst. So she's asked me to ask on her behalf. So I shall. Um, now, it was, she was saying that they went and visited. Um, Hemel Leonard in 2019 and some of the vineyards were recovering from some fires um, that had been there and she was wondering whether there had been any fires this summer um, and whether the I'm assuming she means the fires in 2019 whether that affected any of our producers um, that might be something we have to check with Joe. but yeah I'd have to check with Joe in terms of actual producers um I know that there, I know it was challenging. Um, I certainly spoke to Hamilton and Russell and I don't know if they've been affected directly as in the vineyards, um, but yeah, they, there was definitely a big effect on everything, local economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't know whether any of our producers were affected directly. And to my knowledge, but I could be wrong, there haven't been any fires in 2020. So um, certainly not anything on the scale previously. So um, yeah, I think I think safe from safe from um, that point. But ah, oh, so Keith has just said that there was um, that Ham Hamilton Russell lost a big chunk of his Pinot Noir. So yeah, I think probably there were lots of people that I might not be aware of that Joe might be aware of, but. Um, there haven't been any, to my knowledge, this year. So it might be that the 2019 vintage is more effective than the 2020. Perfect. So I think the next question um, we've got is hopefully maybe from Adam Chadwick. Now, Adam, we're going to see if we can unmute you and if you're there to ask the question yourself. Hello, Adam. Um, if you are, go ahead. If not, I can ask on your behalf. Hi there. Yes, I'm here. Can you yeah, hear me? Lovely. Hello, Adam. Yeah. Hi there. Um, my question was about the current that runs up the coast of uh, South Africa. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we often get climate change questions at these uh, at these webinars, and my question was about the current. You know, does it get affected, or has it been affected by climate change? And if so, is that noticeable in the vintage that is produced in that particular year or that particular time scale? Really interesting question, because um, that is one big thing about South Africa. They've got different climate change issues, should we say, um, to perhaps what you might think of in in Europe as 
we expect, you know, it's not temperature rising on the land that's necessarily the problem. Um, at the moment, I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence that the current is increasing in temperature. However, uh, long term, we might consider melting of ice caps. Is that going to increase the current? Is it going to cause flooding on the southern parts of the Cape? Um, they have obviously suffer with drought problems as well. So uh, there might also be a knock on effect. Um, you know, there might be significant drought problems um, and lesser current. So all of those factors might start adding up. Um, but I don't think there's any hard evidence at the moment to suggest significant increase in Benguela current temperatures. Um, but I think we should all be slightly nervous about the um, behaviours, should we say. Um, th there has previously been evidence geologically that uh, huge temperature changes, etc., change the course of currents. So if we're looking really big picture, we don't know whether, um, you know, the Benguela will be behaving in the same way. Um, so it's a fascinating question. And I think something to watch out for and look out for, for sure. Um, it's got its own unique set of climate change challenges. So great question. Lovely. So I think the next question we've got is from um, Pia. Now, hopefully, again, we'll be unmuting you yep. shortly. Um, yeah, if I you'd have, like to go ahead, Pia. I have unmuted, I think. Um, Thank you. Yes. No. Even though we're talking about the particular regions of South Africa, I think I would just like to have, if you have any comments regarding the present situation in South Africa regarding wine and vineries, because, you know, the ban on selling any alcoholic drink since the 26th of March, except for a few weeks in, in June, well, it got the ban came back quite recently yeah this is hitting all the small vineyards like iona catherine marshall there's you know in these districts it's such a it's a terrible situation but i don't know can you still import or are they still not allowed to transport anything to the airport yes. so uh we are allowed to we are they have allowed imports um however coronavirus has hugely affected cape town port itself yeah. So allowing e exports, as it were, so we, we can make orders and they can be sent. Um, but the delay has been unbelievable. And Joe, you know, will know far more about it. But from firsthand experience of, of doing winemaker tastings recently, um, we're talking six week delays in some cases, sometimes more. And that's affecting order levels, stock levels. We've certainly seen our South African stock sell out very quickly at the Wine Society and we can't get the replacements very quickly. Um, but as you mentioned in your first point, another real sadness is um, in terms of the small producers who perhaps export less is that they are unable to do cellar door sales. Um, and on top of that, wine tourism is so important in South Africa. Yeah. Actually, if you remove cellar door sales even from local communities then you remove cellar door sales from wine tourism and then you have problems in the ports with exports um, and delays and problems then we're talking the unperfect storm as it were um reading up on a few articles you know there are people who are really concerned and worried um I think the saving grace is that South Africa wine community, in my opinion, is like unlike any other in the world. Um, people pull together in a huge way in the South African wine community. Um, and obviously, if you've visited, I'm sure you've seen that. But um, I, I happen to live there half the year. So. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> Many years. Yeah, Well, exactly. And people do tend to pull together and, um, you know, there's lots of people prepared to help each other to add orders. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, add combine orders to make things easier and and there's a real camaraderie around South African winemaking so um I, f I feel for them I've spoken to a few producers getting some images from this presentation and I, w I won't name names but heard sentences like these have been the worst six months of my life and you know yeah, things yeah. Like um there's no denying it's it's a really really tough environment it's very very sad because the wines are fantastic I know. Um, the, uh, we've discussed uh, with a winemaker uh, from Ritzy uh, in Italy last week. He said, I'm very fortunate that my wines set, they age well. And it's a strange thing to have to think about. 
Um, but, you know, we might have uh, in 2021 the opportunity to buy a huge amount of very, very good quality, ageable South African wines. Um, whereas, yeah, if you're making wines that need to be drunk in 12 months and you can't get them shipped out quickly enough, then um, heartbreaking. I agree. Thank you. So I think we've got a question coming up from um, Christine Elliott. Christine, if you'd like to ask your question. Well, firstly, it just shows you how uh, difficult it is when an email is registered to one member of a family and the other <laughs> one is on. Hello, uh, it's Christine. Actually, it, it's, actually, it's actually John Elliott. Uh, Hello, what John. I Hello, to John. Know, what I wanted to know was you made a remark about the Catherine Marshall Pinot Noir and how I felt you were saying that it was trying to emulate a French style um, Pinot Noir, Burgundy. Uh, in general, how do the producers in these areas try to emulate French styles or is it something they deliberately try not to do? A great question. Um, I think it's a case by case basis. Um, so there are certain producers that would much prefer, and you might even find that even within one winery, they might have two different styles of Pinot. Um, for example. Um, but with Catherine, to be more specific on her, she has imported five uh, different Burgundian clones of Pinot. She's using, uh, you know, cold maceration, a lot of Burgundian techniques. She's uh, using Burgundian barrels. So um, I think without putting words in her mouth, it would be very difficult to argue that she's not trying to um, emulate certainly a new world version of the Burgundy. Um, that being said, because of all the extra sunshine, there, it's very rare that you would say that is a Burgundy. They're still, they still have their own character. They do have different soils. They do have uh, different sunlight, different water levels. You know, we're no, you're never gonna make a carbon copy. Um, but I do think that there are a wave of South African winemakers undoubtedly producing wines in a Burgundian style and doing a fantastic job of it. Um, yeah, right down to the clonal selection and the rootstocks, um, taking, uh, taking leave from, from Burgundians. Uh, a lot of them have done vintages there as well. And I think Burgundy is one of those places where you fall in love with it and then you want to create your own version of it in whichever little corner of the world you're in. So I don't blame them at all, but uh, I have to say, I think I'd rather live in uh, Hemel and Ard and make Burgundian styles that I would in Burgundy, but that's a personal choice. <laughs> so I think the next question, I think um, it might be our last question, is from Peter Cousins. Peter, if you'd like to ask. Hello, Peter. Hello, hello, Anna. Great presentation. Um, I, I've been to Stellenbosch and uh, Franschhoek. And they have uh, the, the wine visitor experience, the like wine tourist experience is really great. You know, they've often got, the wineries often have great restaurants to go along with the wines you can taste. And I wondered if, it, I don't know the regions you've been talking about. I wonder if it's the same down there. And if so, if you could recommend which ones are great from a wine visitors, wine tourist point of view. Absolutely, with pleasure, but it will make me deeply upset that I can't go again this year. Um, I would say that um, to start with Constantia, because it's the easiest from Cape Town, it really is doable. If you're staying in Cape Town, you can nip there in a taxi in 20 minutes. Um, they have some unbelievable uh, restaurants. So there is a restaurant called, a high-end restaurant called Colo Colomb which also has a sister restaurant in Franschhoek that is delicious. And you kind of get these tasting menus that are nine courses and you jaw drops at the price with amazing wines. And so La Colombe, uh, we, also stay, we also visited Chef's Table, uh, which is part of a winery. Most of the wineries in Constantia are, there's less of them, but they are geared up for tourists. So even Klein Constantia has a gorgeous bistro uh, restaurant. So you could take on a a visit and then go for uh, lunch. They've all got great tasting rooms. I think part and parcel of being a South African winery is you have to have this unbelievable tasting room. Uh, so they've all got great places. Um, Hemel and Ard, I would say Newton Johnson that I actually was lucky enough to visit with Joe um, has just put in a new restaurant and it's gorgeous. And it's the image of the 
uh, me looking down the valley. Um, again, they you could do the Hemelinard route and have the most wonderful day. Uh, you might want to make it two days, but you could just drive up there and it's not a long route. Um, there's a few other wineries that we don't work with, but that have really nice tastings programs. So food and wine pairing things. Um, so Creation does a good food and wine, you know, chocolate and wine and blah, blah, blah and wine. Um, and then for me, my absolute favorite must visit is in Hermanus town. There is a restaurant built into the caves called Bidentang's Cave. And you sit on this flat rock bed with shaded by the cave and the water's just lapping up on the side and they have all the all the local wines so it's sort of we we have fish and chips and a I don't know like fish platter so it doesn't feel like the food's particularly high end and it's you know paper napkin -y thing but all of the wines are the local Hemelinard wines so you're sat there with a wine list to die for um getting those cool breezes you know the the breezes that you've been hearing about in all the wineries and you're just sat there getting it all through your hair so I'd highly recommend that as well but um on, honestly South Africa's wine tourism um is arguably the best in the world probably only beaten by maybe California if in my opinion probably not I think South Africa does have the best wine tourism in the world so um it's if you get opportunity to go back please do um branch out and visit those places because they are not to be missed and the food quality is exceptional everywhere so you'll be treated well and you'll be very well fed and watered perfect i think as soon as we're all able to i think we'll all be planning a trip to south africa at the <laughs> soonest opportunity <laughs> unfortunately for now we'll just have to order some lovely wines and drink those and pretend we're there um, <laughs> but i think that is everything in the way of questions um, we've had a couple of specific um sort of stock questions so we'll be getting back to you on those ones by email and as anna said we will send the um the slides round to you as well so you can um have a little bit of a closer look at the maps i really like the thermal map it's really good like we had this with matthew's greek um presentation as well i think when you can see the areas on a map and you can really visualize it in a way that you don't necessarily get just from talking about the region. It makes it much clearer. So thank you for including those. Um, no and I think that is, is everything. So um, Anna, if you'd like anything else to say, but I think we're, we're drawing to a close there. No, just actually to finish off on that last point, I think when you can get to South Africa and if you can, um, these guys are gonna need a lot of support. Um, so I think let's support them buying their wine, but when, as and when we can, and if you can, then it would be great to support them by going out there and seeing it in real life as well. I hope you all have a lovely evening um, and I will uh, hopefully see you again soon. <laughs>